Thanks for joining us on episode 1439 of the Inspired Stewardship Podcast. I'm Janice McWilliams. I challenge you to invest in yourself, invest in others, develop your influence, and impact the world by using your time, your talent, and your treasures to live out your calling. Having the ability to recognize that self-care doesn't have to be a big challenge is key, and one way to be inspired to do that is to listen to this, the Inspired Stewardship Podcast with my friend Scott Mater. I hope I have helped people figure out how to live better so that they feel better as they're pursuing their call. That they're, they know how to take care of themselves, no matter how stressful a life situation may be. Welcome and thank you for joining us on the Inspired Stewardship Podcast. If you truly desire to become the person who God wants you to be, then you must learn to use your time, your talent, and your treasures for your true calling. In the Inspired Stewardship Podcast, you will learn to invest in yourself, invest in others, and develop your influence so that you can impact the world. In today's podcast episode, I interview Janice McWilliams. I ask her about why the way we do self-care is so wrong. I also ask her about how we can make it right instead by paying attention to the hormone soup. And she also shares her journey to discovering this different way to view self-care. I've got a new book coming out called Inspired Living, Assembling the Puzzle of Your Call by Mastering Your Time, Your Talent, and Your Treasures. You can find out more about it and sign up for getting more information over at inspiredstewardship.com, Inspired Living. That's inspiredstewardship.com, inspired living. Janice McWilliams is a psychotherapist in private practice, a certified spiritual director, a speaker, and the author of Restore My Soul, Reimagining Self-Care for a Sustainable Life. Janice completed her Master's of Divinity at Howard University and her counseling degree at Loyola University in Maryland. Janice's love of the depths and intrigue of the human experience is matched by her desire to find her place in God's work of restoring and revitalizing souls everywhere. Her blog promotes spiritual, relational, and psychological transformation. Welcome to the show, Janice. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Absolutely. So I talked a little bit in the intro about some of the work you do and your book, Restore My Soul, and and various things. But I always laugh. I always tell people that I feel like intros are like Instagram photos in that we always frame the highlights, yeah. right? We leave out some of the stuff. And yet our journeys are usually a lot messier than that. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. Can you share a little bit about your journey and what brought you to the point of focusing on this and sharing this message in the world? Yeah, absolutely. I I come from a background in campus ministry with the InterVarsity. And so I, and particularly I, in, in that experience, I learned through failures and some wins just about how do you pace your life? So most of my young adult and, and in my 30s, I was doing this ministry. There was always more you could do. I, I was ambitious and felt like I'll do anything for the gospel. And so there were ways in which I was just stretching and working really hard. And I had some good rhythms in my life as far as over overall self-care and things, but there were definitely some holes. And later on in my life, as I was becoming a, a therapist and spiritual director, I was moving more into training and I was training young campus ministers And in that space, I realized they were coming, they needed to learn ministry skills, but they also just needed to know how to pace their life so that they didn't completely burn out at some point. And, and this really stuck with me. It became, it became something that was pretty essential to the training that I was helping them learn how to pace their lives. Then the pandemic hit. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so while I'm thinking about this increasingly, and I'm but I'm also working as a therapist and a spiritual director, and all, often I'm having people who are overwhelmed and fatigued and burned out come to therapy. And I'm even thinking about like, how do people learn to take care of themselves so they can follow their call for the long haul? Mm-hmm. And just this fundamental belief, I really don't think Jesus wants people to burn out. <laughs> what can we do about this? So then the pandemic hit. And as in the beginning of the pandemic, everybody goes online and including all the therapists. And that was really draining and stressful for everyone. But one thing that was really increasingly, that was also really difficult for, for me and for therapists was that people in the beginning of the pandemic, there were all these, gosh, is this going to last another month? Is it going to last another until the summer? And <laughs> did you see the CDC report and all this? And so people were really processing a lot of anxiety about the same things I was anxious about, mm-hmm. which is pretty different counseling than usual. Every once in a while, you might have one person in a day that you really relate to like that. But like for every person after person to be talking about the same thing that is stressing me out was like, oh, that was hard. We had a meeting of, of therapists, a group supervision time early on in the pandemic to talk about like, how are we doing and how do we take care of ourselves? And I made this decision that in between every session, I was going to do a a set of stretches, do a sun salutation and do a breath prayer Mm -hmm. in between every session. So the breath prayer on the inhale, Lord Jesus Christ, son of David, and on the exhale, have mercy on me, a sinner. That just happens to be my favorite breath prayer, but I was inhale and exhale doing a breath prayer, moving my body in this series of stress stretches in between every session. So it means I did it like five times in a day. That intervention alone made a completely different, it made a huge difference in the way my body felt and my spirit Mm -hmm. felt at the end of the day of counseling. And I realized altogether that only took me like six or seven minutes to do. And it, it really like, oh my goodness, what does this mean? It it cranked me into this thinking like, wow, self-care does not necessarily have to be so difficult and overwhelming. So many of us just think of it as another big thing to add that just feels impossible when life feels impossible. Mm -hmm. And and that, all those things that built in me, and then at that punctuation point for me, I realized there's a message here that self-care, really meaningful self-care that can really impact us for the good does not have to be so difficult. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that's a, that's a bit of my. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about being involved with youth ministry and, and all of that. And one of the things I like to highlight for people is how our faith journey and our life journey intersects. And you shared some of that just now, but let, let's talk a little bit more about that. How do you feel like this message around self-court care and, and restoring ourselves has affected your faith journey? And then how has your faith journey affected where you've ended up in terms of thinking about self-care? That thing I said that Jesus doesn't want you to burn out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like that was something... I came to through my own years in ministry, just being in the scriptures and learning more about the character of God. And then I think that belief has informed my faith as well to see the care that God has for his people. The the metaphor that's been so rich for me is that of the shepherd and sheep and there's so many there's so many ways to fill out that metaphor but the shepherd cares for the sheep the shepherd knows each little sheep's quirks and tendencies and the ways they might wander away or get lost and knows how to care for them the shepherd leads the sheep into the space of green pastures so that they can be fed and restored and they can find a place of rest. And if they, if those little sheep don't have that place of rest, then they're going to be more vulnerable to sickness. They're going to be, they're not going to be able to produce their wool 
like they are intended to. And, and so there's so much about my growing to shift really from an orientation of uh, it's up to me to, to do the things that God needs me to do in the mm-hmm. kingdom. I put air quotes around that and into a place of realizing what I am, but a sheep being led by the shepherd. Um, it is really not up to me for the kingdom work to be accomplished. And I think some of that is like a natural progression that comes through. Um, and understanding our space in the kingdom of God and how wonderful and fulfilling it is to be a part of God's kingdom, but to know that God ultimately doesn't depend on us to accomplish Mm -hmm. what needs to happen, but it's a gift. And so I feel at at the end of the day, I can still slide into a mentality of it's all up to me. And whenever I do, what I feel drawn back to is I've got you. I see you. Mm-hmm. I care for you. Mm-hmm. And then I, I can be in that space of feeling held and nurtured and to trust that, that Jesus actually wants to show me the way to the green pastures so that I can come and go freely from the green mm-hmm. pasture. And that makes me love Jesus all the more. Mm-hmm. How has that changed your view of the work you do and the, that part of it? In other words, I think a lot of times where I think we struggle on that is in the, you're a therapist, you do spiritual care, you're taking care of other people in a way. You're there for them. How has that view affected the work you do, if that makes sense. That idea of it's not all on you, but yet here you are doing a role that in some ways it is all on you, in in air quotes again, kind of thing. How do you think that's affected that relationship? I'm grateful for that kind of foundation of belief and foundation of experiential reality that it is not up to me that I can get into, but that doesn't mean I don't struggle with it. <laughs> when I'm in a therapy session, it's going sideways or, or somebody doesn't seem to be being progressing in, in treatment. My, my automatic response to that is what I do wrong. Like, how do I fix this? What do I need to do? This is all on me. But the invitation I feel is one of pivoting towards a dependent posture myself. Lord, what is happening here? What's happening for this person? Mm-hmm. I, I think that it, it, when I'm at my best in that mindset, then I'm much more relaxed and curious about what's happening and less stressed and anxious and worried about my own performance. When I'm in that better place, I'm probably, I'm more likely to sit in to go slower with a client to bring them into the presence of God and see what might happen. So it's a wonderful corrective for me in my work that I imagine a lot of people, no matter what their vocation can relate to. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking earlier about self-care, you mentioned doing the small thing of air and air quotes around small thing of the breath prayer and the stretching and a few moments of physical movement and spiritual recentering and how big of an effect that had on you for the whole day. I'm a big believer in tiny habits and compounding behavior is what I call it. We all talk about compound interest, but it's no compounding behavior. Do the little things over and over again, and it adds up to a lot. Yeah, love. How do you view self-care? What do you think people misunderstand about it? or get wrong when they're thinking about self-care and what's the reframe that you like to put them through? Oh yeah. Uh, Let me start with a little anecdote. 
I, I was writing, I was working on writing this book about self-care and my friend texted me and she said, oh my gosh, Janice, there's a line of self-care Barbies. <laughs> and I was like, what? But I looked it up right away and sure enough, there's a breathe with me Barbie and there's a spa day Barbie. <laughs> all the, all the, there's a line of them, which of course I, I purchased all of them because they were so hilarious. But I, I, but what I realized is that particularly this spa day Barbie is what makes me so frustrated about how people conceptualize self-care because having a spa day is a perfectly wonderful thing to do. I'm, I don't have anything against doing a spa day, but what it cements in people's minds is that self-care is something I do when my life is not working and I'm exhausted and fatigued and burning the candle at both ends. And I stop what I'm doing and I do the spa day, which is really expensive, probably requires many hours of childcare. And I do the thing and then it's great. And you feel great. It probably represents some kind of a bit of recovery. And then you resume the unsustainable life again on Monday, immediately following the spa day. So it doesn't have a real lasting impact. Things like that spa day to me are best when they're replenishment for people and not just recovery, helping them barely survive and hang on. And so what I like people to do is shift from Barbie style self-care mindset to an integrated that self-care should be both daily and doable, that it's woven into their days. So I love to teach my clients um, about this idea I call hormone soup. So this came from a time when I was, I had one of my housemates made tortilla soup (laughs) and I had a bite of this tortilla soup and I was like, oh, wow, this has got like a big kick. Bite two or three, I'm becoming uncomfortable. <laughs> but like the, the fourth bite, I'm like, I don't think I'm going to eat this soup. And um, my friend who made the soup said, something's wrong with the soup. And we checked the recipe. And sure enough, she had put a tablespoon of cayenne in the recipe. <laughs> and, it, and it called for a teaspoon, something I think all of us have done. A lot of people would love that soup. But for me, it was like I wasn't used to it. It was burning my mouth up. But people who cook know you don't necessarily have to throw out that vat of soup just because it has too much spice in it. You might be able to add brown sugar or yogurt or potatoes or something to mellow Mm -hmm. out the flavor and make it really palatable again. And so this was like a little aha for me when thinking about our bodies and what does self-care really mean? Because if you think of your body as a vat of soup you're cooking every day and you start the day with stock and your ingredients are just loosely stress hormone and happy hormone and that you're making deposits of stress and happy hormone and to make this mm-hmm. soup palatable. What, what will happen is like a lot in a lot of periods of our lives, we're going to have a lot of stress hormone in our soup. It just you might, your stock at the beginning of the day might be already overspiced, but we don't have to throw out that soup. Like a lot of times people will get the message from their doctor, eliminate your stressors. And so you'll feel better. And then I'm like, sometimes you can't really eliminate your stressors now, can you? you know? But if I do that, I'll go to prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what if your stressor is your teenage child or your... Like I said, if I eliminate my stressors, I'll go to prison. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So yeah, sometimes you, you can't do that. So you're going to have stress hormone. Mm -hmm. But I want people to know how to put more deposits of happy hormone or soothing hormone into their days to balance out that soup so that it's actually palatable and even tasty throughout the Mm -hmm. day. And that's what something like the moving the body and saying breath prayer does is it, it adds a deposit into the body of soothing and happy hormones in the midst of what may be a very stressful, you know, part of life. So that that thinking about that hormone soup and making a recipe that makes your soup taste good when morning, midday, and evening, that's what I like to help people conceptualize because I feel like it is, it makes it really doable to think Mm -hmm. about what are the things I could sprinkle throughout my day that represent the the deposits of happy hormone that are going to help me feel better. Mm -hmm. 
what are some of those things that people can add to the the rhythm of their day that you found that that help what are some of the quote low hanging fruit for lack of a better word yeah. in terms of most of us could probably do this kind of yeah. thing yeah i love just talking to people about a better break like a lot of people when i ask them do you take a break during your day at all and most people do take some kind of break and some people take fabulous breaks but most of us, when they take a break, most of us pick up our phones. <laughs> now, our phones may give us happy news, it may, but it may also give us stressful news headlines. We may check our work email, which is usually represents a deposit of stress hormone. There may be ads in your social media feed that make you question whether you're too fat, wrinkled, old, whatever. Like that, that, that. Mm-hmm gives you stress hormone as well. So I just like to coach people around two or three times a day. What if you take a better break and a better break just means anything that puts happy hormone into your body. And so for me, that might be just really stopping and sipping a cup of tea. It could mean stepping outside, walking around the block. It could mean playing playful or just soothing music that helps me. So I love challenging people to a better break at least once or twice a day. So totally accessible and you can be creative and do it in any way you like. The other thing I like to suggest is a swap out. And a swap out is basically, is there something you do every day that's pretty stressful that you could just swap out for something that's not (laughs) so stressful? Uh, So not unlike a better break, but The way that this often works for me is on my commute to and from work. My standard practice is to listen to NPR. I listen to the news. That's how I catch up on the news. But when I feel my um, body is overstressed um, or a little too spicy, I don't do that. I I listen to music instead. So I swap out. It doesn't take any more time to do this, but it makes a big difference. Swapping out news for music that just makes me happy Mm. there a lot of people will do something like over the morning coffee they'll read the news or or they'll check the work email what if you read a psalm and while you drink your coffee instead so those things would be swap outs Mm. so i i love to challenge people right off the bat can you plan a better break can you plan a swap out at least one of each and just see what the impact is Mm -hmm. What have you seen in terms of, I, I find a lot of times when we're introducing new behavior, new habit, uh-huh. there's an initial pushback, for lack of a better word, <laughs> a, a, a rebound yeah. effect of, no, that's not going to work because whatever. Uh-huh. What have you found that people find challenging when they're trying to shift those rhythms? <laughs> There, you're right. There is a lot of skepticism, usually really helping people understand the hormone soup metaphor is pretty compelling because the way we actually feel in our bodies and emotionally is so directly related to the hormones in our body. And, and people don't really, you know, that's just the way we're made. Mm-hmm. And Sometimes the resistance can be overcome by that. But when whenever I'm setting up a hormone soup plan with somebody, I'm like, okay, what's it going to look like for you to actually lean into this experiment? And do you need reminders in your phone? Do you need post-it notes? What will it take? Or if people are thinking, we talk about it and they're like, I'm probably not going to do this. Then I'm like, okay, let's dial it back to something that's more doable to you than whatever we've just planned. Like, to dial it into the intervention that the person is really and truly willing to experiment with. And so usually we can get to one and I, I, the results are pretty, pretty great. When folks actually lean into this and do it, they do find like, Oh, it actually is very helpful to do some of these small things and just supporting me while I'm going through this difficult time in life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So why did you choose to write the book? 
restore my soul, the reimagining self-care for a sustainable life, which by the way, I love the su- subtitle. I know. But why, why did you choose to put the message in a book? Oh, I think it was just because I was seeing so consistently in my work in therapy and spiritual direction that people were suffering and feeling terrible. And there would come a, a point in our sessions inevitably where I would say, okay, how can you start feeling better tomorrow? We want to do some things that help support you right away. And I realized that not only the interventions like the better break and the, and the swap out, which are about the rhythms of our days, but I realized that there were these other realms of that I felt like were mission critical when it came to daily self-care, the realm of thoughts, the realm of emotions, and the realm of rhythms, and then the realm of fulfillment. And so that's what the book covers is what does self-care look like in the realm of our thoughts? What does it look like in the realm of our emotions? What does it look like in the realm of rhythms? And what does it look like in the realm of fulfillment? And fulfillment is like the most neglected, I feel like, of the four that, that people aren't talking about. My I my anecdotal belief in the work that I'm doing is that if people don't experience a sense of fulfillment in most days, they're going to start to feel pretty bad. I also noticed that a lot of people who would come to me would have gone through getting really overwhelmed and life caving in on them and getting really fatigued. And so they would go through this, I'm going to quit everything extra Mm -hmm. or quit everything I can and then come to therapy. And then we get into the therapy work for a while and realize, oh, when you quit everything, you ended up quitting things that were really meaningful to you (laughs) that Mm -hmm. brought you great joy and fulfillment. (laughs) We need to reintroduce some of these things back into your life. Um, with this overall uh, plan to care for yourself better so that you can experience the fulfillment that volunteering brought or that prayer meeting brought or that that lunch with a friend brought when they went through the flurry of quitting everything. They quit all those things. Yeah, I, I feel like the book just came from this sense of the best practices that almost everybody would benefit from considering. And I do think that the book is, it. I think it's best when you consider it to be a manual that you come and go from, that you might revisit at different periods of your life because it it has distinct skills in each of the four realms to learn. And at different points in your life, you might benefit from the skills of the different areas. It, It, At one point in your life, you really might be struggling with the way your thoughts are making you feel. You're plagued with worry or with rumination or with despair. And then you really might want to tackle the skills that relate to holding on to thoughts in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, But at another point in your life, you really might be, I need that better break and swap out. I need to think about, I need to think about the rhythms of my day. What are my mornings like? What are my evenings like? And tackle that. So it, it's a great resource. I hope that people can revisit over time. Mm-hmm. When you think about those areas that you were just talking about, thought, fulfillment, and all of that, I think a lot of times where the quitting everything comes from is people confuse busy with productive, right? That it has almost become in our culture that I'm busy is the knee jerk answer to the question of how you're, how are you doing? It used to be, I'm fine. Now it's, I'm busy. (laughs) And it's almost like that's a badge of honor. Yeah. And yet busy just means my time is filled up. That's really all that means. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm doing anything fulfilling or anything that is I want to do or anything else. It just means I've filled my calendar. How do you help people begin to differentiate between those things that they're doing because they feel obligated to, because they have to, because, and again, there's some things that we have to do just because you're an adult human being and you live in the world and <laughs> laundry's got to get done. <laughs> sorts of, nobody really wants to do laundry, <laughs> but those sorts of things. What? How do you help folks begin to 
divide and differentiate between those sorts of activities? One of my favorite things to look at in regards to this great topic is to look at the life of Jesus. In the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus in in a day in his life. And so midway through that first chapter of Mark, he is teaching in the synagogue. And I'm thinking, oh, great output. You, you must be exhausted. End of your day. No, it's not the end of his day because a demon obsessed person comes and he delivers that person. And then I'm like, job well done. Now you can relax. Nope. Um, he goes to Simon's um, house and heals Simon's mother-in-law. Um, then I'm thinking, now you're good, right? No. Then the whole town comes after dark that at that house of people who are sick and possessed. And he does all this healing and deliverance. So I, I appreciate this day in the life of Jesus because it's like a busy, fast, and productive. I call it a fast day. It's a day mm-hmm. where a lot was happening. Jesus was open to interruptions. He went from here to there. He had a, a yeah, bring it on mentality about it. And I like it because we can all relate to life being like that sometimes. Sometimes it's just fast. There's a lot going on, right? The next morning, it's really interesting because he gets up before it's light. So he possibly didn't even sleep at hours that night. I don't know. He had the late night of doing healing and deliverance ministry. The early morning, he gets up before it's light and goes to pray. Now, the disciples come to find him and say, basically, hey, all the people are waiting for you for day two of this awesome ministry you started yesterday of healing and deliverance. Won't it be fabulous? Let's keep doing it. But Jesus says to them, no, because I'm going to go to the next towns and preach there also, for that is why I came. So while we're not privy to that prayer time, Mm -hmm. it does seem to imply, his actions afterwards seem to imply that in that prayer time, he really got direction about what was his to do. So doing the next day of the healing and deliverance ministry would have been wonderful. Everybody was expecting him to do it, namely the possessed and sick people, but his close disciples expected yeah. him to do it. So that's, that's a lot of pressure. And all of us can relate to feeling the pressure to do the obvious thing everyone, absolutely everyone wants you to do. But what Jesus is able to discern is his own mission is different than that, that going to the next towns and preaching there is what is his to do. So I love that prayer is just to ask God, what's mine to do? And a lot of times I think we can find discernment about just the busy things that everyone expects us to do versus the things we in particular are called to do. And it helps us find the ability to say no to some things and to to find our yes for the things that we're most aligned with, that are most about who we are and who we're gifted to be and why we're on this earth. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's like the best kind of stewardship there is, is to be able to have the kind of relationship with God where we're able to find our yeses and our noes in the midst of life, to be able to have the courage to disappoint some people in order to be really focused on what we are really intended to be about. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I've found is when we have the courage to do that, all of a sudden those things that we thought would never get done because I'm the only one that can do that. All of a sudden somebody else steps up and starts doing it. And oftentimes their gifting is aligned with the thing and they do it even better than you did. Yes, you're you're so right. And and, and often, if anything, I've seen people get mad at, now the new person's doing it better than me. And it's like, no, be thankful for that. That is a blessing. That is not a curse. Definitely. Keep keep your mouth shut and say, how can I support you in your ministry? That that is the right response to that. And yet Um, there is a natural feeling of, oh, they're doing it better than me. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, you probably held on to it a little longer than you should have, maybe. 
It does happen. And again, I get that because I've done that. I understand that fully. That's easy to do. So I've got a few questions that I like to ask all of my guests, but before I, I ask you those, is there anything else about the work you do or the book or the, this hormone soup metaphor that you really want the listener to hear? I just want everyone to sense the invitation from God that burnout is not God's desire for you <laughs> and that meaningful self-care does not have to be as hard as you think. Awesome. So you mentioned stewardship a minute ago, and that's my brand, Inspired Stewardship, and I run things through that lens of, of stewardship. And yet that's one of those words that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So when you hear the word stewardship, what does that word mean to you? <laughs> I love thinking about stewarding our inner world. I know you think a lot about stewardship. In my kind of in this journey of thinking about self care, I uh, my focus um, initially, even the language I was have been using is um, self stewardship. Are you stewarding your inner world, your inner experiences, in a way that enables you to live well, to find the green pastures, to live into your calling and your purpose? So I, I feel like. Learning to do some of the things that, that we've been talking about today is about stewarding yourself well, stewarding your inner world in a way that keeps you steady and as healthy as possible and as connected to Jesus as possible and as aligned with why you're here on this world, on this earth, to, to steward your efforts. So, yeah, I'm all about it. Stewarding your inner world is what I love. Awesome. So I, this is my favorite question that I like to ask everybody. Imagine for a minute that I could invent this magic machine. Mm -hmm. And with this machine, I could pull you from where you are today, pluck you from the seat and transport you into the future, maybe 150, maybe 250 years. Mm -hmm. But through the power of this machine, you were able to look back and see your entire life, see all of the connections, all of the ripples, all of the impacts you've left behind. What impact do you hope you've left in the world? I hope I have helped people figure out how to live better so that they feel better as they're pursuing their call, that they're, they know how to take care of themselves, no matter how stressful a life situation may be, that, that they know right away how to help themselves in their inner world, orient towards more steadiness and more peace, more focus on God, more turning to God for help, small interventions in their day to give them rest and reprieve. So I, I hope that is my impact. So what's on the roadmap? What's coming next as you continue on this journey? I love talking about this um, topic a lot. I have had some great experiences of really being able to tailor the content of my book to people who are ministry leaders. And so I'm coming soon. We'll have an online course for ministry leaders that, that takes the concepts of from restore my soul, but just really bring some biblical foundation and some anecdotes that are particularly tailored to people who are either pastors or ministry leaders of some kind, because I am particularly excited about empowering people who are called to ministry to be able to do it without burning out. And mm -hmm. these days, I, mean, I think that the numbers are about 40% of ministry leaders are reporting some level of burnout. And that really alarms me. I don't want to see people abdicating their sense of call because they can't figure out how to live well into their calls. You can find out more about Janice McWilliams over at hormonesoupresource.com. Of course, I'll have a link to that over in the show notes as well. Janice, is there anything else you'd like to share with the listener? That hormonesoupresource.com has 50 self-care ideas that take five minutes or less. 
So I encourage you to grab that resource and make your own hormone soup plan using some of those ideas and coming up with some of of your own. But I wish you well, and I definitely hope that you will make the daily and doable changes that make you feel better so that you can pursue your kingdom living without overwhelm or burnout. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for listening to the Inspired Stewardship Podcast. As a subscriber and listener, we challenge you to not just sit back and passively listen, but act on what you've heard and find a way to live your calling. If you enjoyed this episode, please do us a favor. Go over to inspiredstewardship.com slash iTunes rate, all one word, iTunes rate. It'll take you through how to leave a rating and review and how to make sure you're subscribed to the podcast so that you can get every episode as it comes out in your feed. Until next time, invest your time, your talent, and your treasures, develop your influence, and impact the world.